Hey you all, Farmer Jesse here. Today we are wrapping up our superbly nerdy series on the four primary principles of soil health and soil conservation. A series supported in part by a grant from Southern Sayre. Indeed, this video is part of a series, but you do not have to watch the whole series to enjoy this video or any of the other videos. They are not necessarily dependent on one another, nor sequential. Consequential? But the principles I've covered so far are keeping the soil covered as much as possible, keeping it planted as much as possible, avoiding soil disturbances, sort of. And so the remaining principle is biodiversity. And yes, for those who've asked, I will indeed touch on animal integration towards the end of this video and why I didn't give animals their own video. So let's do it. First things first, if you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. That's just math. Also, if you're enjoying this series and want a deeper dive or just want to support our work, you can do both. Consider picking up a copy of my book, The Living Soil Handbook, uh, from notillgrowers.com specifically, where I should say it is currently backordered as I post this, like the publisher is out of copies, but it will be back in stock soon around the end of September 2021. So you can order it, which supports our work, but the book just won't come for a while. We just kind of sold too many because you all are awesome. Yep. Okay, so biodiversity, why? Why is it important to the soil? Why can't we simply plant the same crop over and over as long as we're following all the other principles of conservation agriculture? Well, for starters, that's just not really how nature rolls. Nowhere in nature does there exist a legit monoculture. Even the giant aspen groves of the Rocky Mountains are not monocultures, but rather one giant organism surrounded by and supportive of many, many other organisms. And aspens play a very interesting role as well as a pioneering species in their ecosystems, aspens being some of the first species to return after major disturbances like a fire. Uh, but I'm not going to go into that, even though I do kind of want to because aspens are super fascinating. Anyway, nature is designed around biodiversity because biodiversity equals resilience. If a major disturbance like a fire or a flood or I don't know, a subdivision comes along, biodiversity ensures that nature can recover that ecosystem once said disturbance has passed. Some species will die out while others like aspens will slowly start to get their ecosystem back in balance, growing quickly and rapidly filling the soil with photosynthesizing plants, pumping in carbon to support more and more plants. But that's mostly relevant to perennials, right? Well, yes and no though I think we should all be striving to add more native perennial plants to our farms, annual plants fill an environmental niche as well. Uh, annuals are great pioneering plants where a perennial plant can take a couple years to get established. For instance, annuals cover the soil rapidly and start filling the soil battery, as we talked about in other videos, with energy from the sun. And that's energy that those perennials can later utilize. And even once the perennials are established, annuals can use sunlight that is not captured by the perennial plants in the lower parts of the canopy generally. Because they are fast growing, annuals also obviously provide farmers with economic opportunities, uh, but also a great variety of nutrients through grains and leaves and fruit and flowers and stems and roots. Indigenous Americans, who I have been trying to highlight a lot in this series for their brilliant and often underappreciated approach to land stewardship, employed annuals quite widely, including grains and, you know, pseudo cereals from crops like quinoa, uh, buckwheat, amaranth uh, and corn, as well as annual fruits like squashes, various pulses or beans, uh, different tubers and roots, just many, many annual plants. Modern culture has long tried to sort of relegate Native Americans to this idea of simple hunter-gatherers who lived lightly on the land and forged what they found and occasionally, I don't know, chased buffalo or whatever, but that's not even a little bit accurate, let alone realistic. Certainly indigenous cultures would move around. They're very nomadic in many cases and some more than others, but no one would survive for very long living spontaneously like that. And indigenous Americans were no dummies. They were living here for thousands of years, doing just fine before being dispossessed of their lands. And although they certainly hunted and gathered, what they were hunting and gathering was part of a design and a lot of work and intention. They were not just wandering around the woods hoping to stumble upon some edible plants or sticks straight enough for arrows. No, they were encouraging those things in a myriad of ways, from fires to coppicing to sowing seeds and transplanting roots. Uh, they molded the landscape to take care of themselves. And in turn, that work took care of the landscape. And in that design, were many annual plants that they would harvest, uh, select for certain traits, then spread widely. 
the amaranth weed in your garden, for instance, it may have originally been spread to your area by indigenous Americans. Why do you think that plant in particular has a bazillion seeds on the seed head? That's more than likely intentional. The product of Native Americans selecting for that trait because the amaranth grain was an incredibly important source for both leaves and seeds long before it was considered a noxious weed. Anyway, Native Americans utilized annual plants because they are just too useful to ignore and they provide a ton of beneficial biodiversity to an ecosystem and a diet. In short, it's not perennials or annuals, it's both. That's biodiversity. You will remember from the keeping the soil planted as much as possible video, or whatever I called it, that each plant attracts its own requisite microorganisms through their novel exudates. If you don't remember because the only video you wanted to watch in this series was this one on biodiversity, well first, that's amazing, but second, root exudates are simply the carbonaceous compounds uh, that plants sort of generate through photosynthesis. They secrete that compound through their roots into the soil for microbes to consume. But like any form of food, exudates don't just nourish, but they also communicate something. Steep, right? And effectively, each plant has its own way of doing this, of using signaling molecules within the exudates to communicate with the world around the roots uh, and manipulate it, or at least that's the goal. But the effect there is that if you have several different kinds of plant species, as well as varieties within the species in the same area, you get a wide diversity and dense population of microbes. What's also true is that each plant has its own special root architecture. This is called root or niche complementarity, and it means that different plants occupy different niches or areas within the soil. Uh, some annuals are deep-rooted, like tomatoes for instance, while others like lettuce are shallow-rooted or others still, like cucurbits, have wide sprawling roots and therefore these crops are not competing with each other below ground as much for things like nutrients and space and water and air. Uh, they are also filling different levels of the soil with roots and microbes and effectively the nutrients those elements gather and contain. If you think about the soil below ground like a big garden, using one crop only fills one third of that garden using multiple different crops fills the entire garden. So if you only had one species of plant in an area, not only would the roots occupy only one level, thus competing with each other for nutrients and water, but they would also attract a limited diversity of soil life. I discussed carbon storage in the plant video and in some studies like the really fascinating 15-year Jena study uh, in Germany, it was demonstrated that, quote, carbon storage strongly increased with increasing plant species richness. In short, diversity for the win. So a diversity of plants leads to a diversity of soil life, but maintaining a diverse soil life is not just of some abstract importance. The greater variety of organisms you have in your soil, the more tools your soil has to collect nutrients and fight off pests and disease and build soil organic matter and all the things. How nerdy should we get here? Like, can I get into quorum sensing? I think I'm gonna get into quorum sensing. Okay, I'll keep this super succinct, but it's very interesting because it's one of those things that sounds like completely batty pseudoscience, but is actually a really well-established and researched microbial phenomenon. It's perhaps most well-known for its role in human pathogens, but it is present wherever microbes exist, and lucky for us, microbes are freaking everywhere. Okay, to make this idea of quorum sensing simple, I'm going to return to my description of the soil as a city. I know it's kind of the comfort blankie of the analogy world, but bear with me here. Like in the last video, think of the soil like a city. And in that city, you have a trillion different little committees and subcommittees, each one with their own tasks to carry out to keep the city running smoothly, right? Um, that could be fighting off invaders, producing food, whatever it is, all the things. But to carry out a task, each committee must meet a quorum. Anyone who has been on any sort of board perhaps knows this term. In the human world, it simply means that enough board members must show up to a meeting for, I don't know, like a budget item to be voted on. If too few people show up, then you don't meet the quorum and the vote doesn't happen. And it's the same in the microbial world. Quorum sensing simply means each microbial committee must sense that there are enough members present to carry out said task. Microbes like fungi and archaea and bacteria do this sort of roll call, if you will, through little chemical signals called autoinducers, which are just communication tools for microbes. You don't need to know that. But what you do need to know is that a diversity of plant roots brings in a diversity of committees of various microbes. This diversity allows the microbes to switch on more and more genes that they may not have access to in, for instance, monoculture. Because the diversity and density of microbial populations, of microbial communities and committees, is simply not there when you're dealing with a single crop. And thus, fewer quorums 
can be met. Remember, there are no monocultures in nature, and therefore plants and microbes did not evolve in single species environments. Again, it's about resilience. Some of these microbial committees are uh, important in a wet year, and others may be crucial in a drought. Anyway, plant diversity leads to a robust and rich and resilient soil city, which I'm thinking I may call Microtropolis. It's like a portmanteau of microbe and metro No, you don't think so? I think it's, okay. And so plants are heavily reliant on those little microbial committees being able to meet their quorums. That leads to better soil performance and healthier plants. Anyway, very fascinating stuff. So for more on this subject, uh, check out some of Dr. Christine Jones's work on it. I've done two interviews with uh, Dr. Jones, or maybe that's the one from Indiana Jones. I've done two interviews with Christine. Um, there's a ton of information about her online. But for now, let's get into how to employ biodiversity on a small vegetable farm. Although it's easy to get carried away with plant diversity and interplanting and relay cropping and all the things, there are a lot of ways to increase plant biodiversity and encourage things like root complementarity and quorum sensing, all those things in the market garden in an entirely practical fashion. For one, cover crops are an excellent way to increase soil life and available nutrients for the subsequent crop or crops. Uh, use a diverse mix of cover crops, uh, as many species as makes sense for the situation. I recently did a video on that. It's up here. You can see that little white thing. Click on that. Uh, grow the cover crop, terminate it however you need to, and then the next plant will benefit from all the good photosynthesis that happens in the microbial gathering. And another option is interplanting. I get real nerdy on interplanting in the Living Soil Handbook, but there are some simple versions of this that make sense for practically any gardener at any level. For instance, interplanting short season crops with long season crops, uh, like beets, for instance, or lettuce or radishes next to early tomatoes or early peppers. Or maybe you can get some spring radishes out of a garden bed before the potatoes come out of that soil. I like planting green onions and lettuce together. It's an easy interplant. Uh, so many simple options to just add a little diversity into the same bed at the same time without affecting yield too tremendously. I'm also personally a big fan of Living Pathways, but I really want to be clear here that I'm not necessarily wanting to endorse them for you yet. Uh, I'm still very much in the figuring it out stage of all this, uh, but the idea is to keep a perennial ground cover there next to the beds for plants to tap into the various nutrients and mycelial networks. This is to me uh, pretty much the only practical version of perennial cover cropping for those of us who rely on low growing plants like lettuce and arugula for income. And real quick for the uninitiated, perennial cover cropping is the idea of keeping a low growing perennial crop, like, I don't know, dwarf clover has been thrown around, there's some others, in a bed at all times and transplanting crops directly into that. I have tried this in several ways and honestly, to date, have basically zero success with it. And I know that's going to bump some people out, but it just hasn't worked for me yet. Not that perennial cover cropping can't work or that won't work, just that I have not yet found that formula for me in my context. In theory, it could be a great way to really maximize the benefits of photosynthesis, but there are a lot of challenges yet to figure out. So more work is needed there, and I really like the Living Pathways as an alternative. Anyway, don't feel like you have to go bonkers fitting a million different species into every single garden bed, but if you can fit two or possibly three and simply have multiple species go through that bed in a single season, that's amazing, and your soil will love you for it. On the microbial side, you need a diversity of not only bacteria and fungi and archaea, but also protozoa and nematodes and all the other soil life and microbial soil animals. I really like vermicompost teas and extracts and combinations of the two, or vermicompost slurries. Before planting anything, we soak each of our garden trays in one of these extract combos, or more often than not, simply in a slurry and allow the plants to soak up any microbial signals, those auto-inducers I mentioned that may be in there, but also any microbes and nutrients that they can before heading out to the field. So basically, we make a decent compost, run it through the worm bins where time allows, uh, take a couple pinches of the castings, sprinkle that in the water, and set the tray in for a few minutes before planting. For me, as someone who relies on farming and therefore efficiency for my living, this is the simplest and most efficient way of inoculating our soils with good microbes. I also do like foliar sprays and soil drenches where possible, but that's all probably for a different video because I haven't discussed animals yet, but I've been talking for a pretty good while, so let's end on animals. One common comment, common comment, I've received throughout this small series is that I have missed one of the primary principles of soil health, animal integration, right? 
Well, I haven't exactly missed it. It's just at first I did vaguely try to stick to the four principles of conservation agriculture as they've been laid out by like the FAO and NRCS. But I also have some reservations about insisting animals are required to have healthy soil in a market garden setting because perhaps unlike, I don't know, broad acreage farming where you're probably growing like long season crops that are not generally intended for direct or raw human consumption, usually just a single crop in a single year, animal integration on a vegetable farm is just a little tricky Though first, know that I love managing livestock, and well-managed animals do amazing things for the soil. I've seen it happen. If you followed this channel for a long time, you know that I have worked with a lot of different animals, and I'm particularly a super fan of sheep specifically, and rotationally grazed them for many years. And in those years, I tried to come up with several different ways to integrate the sheep into my gardens, but I ran into some basic challenges. First, the obvious one on a farm that relies heavily on lettuce and salad greens for income was that there were some food safety concerns, right? If a sheep got into the garden or I had to go out into the pasture for some reason, then I would need to wash off my shoes or not harvest from those areas, etc. Remember that we are certified organic and therefore uh, we have strict rules we have to follow about manure. Anyway, food safety was a concern there and a bit of an obstacle, but obviously those things can be managed even in an organically certified farm like ours. We did it successfully for several years as long as the rules are heated. But I also just had trouble utilizing the sheep in our garden beds because the sheep would, well, simply sink into the soil. Our high rotation garden beds are not firm like a pasture, especially when the beds get up to speed. They are soft and fluffy. I easily pull a carrot out of them with zero issues or forking. So the sheep would sink into the garden beds and leave kind of these awkward potholes everywhere. And I wanna say I always moved the sheep once or twice per day and still had issues. It didn't really matter how long of the duration, one sheep hoof equaled one hole. So in our slow rotation plots, however, we had potatoes, garlic, sweet potatoes, and carrot rotation. And there I did see some potential for having uh, sheep crush or, and or graze cover crops down. I really liked that use of them, but it, it just was limited to those plots. I could not use the sheep in my light fluffy salad plots, but having them graze the sorghum Sudan midsummer or the spring rye, you know, just before I killed the cover crop and put a long season crop in, I liked that. Of course, Another reason I have not leaned on animals in this series is that managing livestock well requires dedication, uh, decent infrastructure, sales outlets, proper nutrition management, a very patient temperament, a sensitivity to the animal's welfare, and not to mention a fair amount of capital in many cases. Animals are not something you can sort of casually have without casually costing you some serious time and money. Then of course, there are great veganic growers out there who don't want animals and don't use animal products, and they do just fine without animal integration. So I don't feel like it makes sense to say you have to have animals for soil health when, well, some people clearly don't. So for new farmers, I just recommend wading slowly into animal integration and really planning it out, getting all the infrastructure and all the things you need. Can animals be amazing for soil? 100% when managed well. Do they make sense for every farm? 100% not always, especially these days when finding land enough to have both gardens and animals is kind of tough. Maybe rabbits or possibly chickens or turkeys on small scale to help fertilize your plot or scratch it up a bit or some rotationally grazed ruminants for your low rotation plots like I mentioned earlier, but don't feel bad if you can't involve livestock or don't want to. To some degree, you can imitate their benefits mildly with composts and teas and ferments and amendments like Bukashi or whatever, um, and as well as well-timed mowings. You can still have healthy soil without animals, but where you can add animals, the soil will not complain about that. Okay, that's going to wrap up this video and this series. Are there other principles and sub-principles I could have covered or that I'd missed? Are there things about biodiversity I missed? Absolutely. In fact, one thing that doesn't ever get enough coverage is just water delivery. How to get the water to the crops because it's so critical for microbial health. So maybe I'll do that a video at some point. Anyway, let me know what I missed or any questions you have. I always think of these videos as somewhat collaborative. So please feel free to put your thoughts below, your insight. I may take next week off just letting you know. I may not also, but anyway, well, huge thanks to Southern Sayer for the support. Again, the Living Soil Handbook is on back order at notillgrowers.com. But if you still want to support our work, you can order a copy and then we'll just send it to you when it comes in. Or there's also the patreon.com slash no-till growers route. That is a huge lifeline for us. Otherwise, thank you all for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.